it's two weeks now and these two weeks have seen something extraordinary Dickens just mentioned a community you know something of an imagined community has come into existence across this country in the last two weeks it is not confined only to those who are here not limited only to those who have joined demonstrations in Delhi and in other parts of the country I can tell you a very large number of students of this country who have never come out for any demonstration and probably never will are part of this imagined community that has been created in the last 14 days in his death, Bimula Rohit has probably done more than many of us put together could have done in our lifetime. I have not been able to come earlier. I was meant to be here on the 26th, but a medical emergency in the family kept me back. But I've spoken to students. I've spoken to students in Delhi. I spoke to a vast gathering in Pune. I spoke to a small college student in Mangaluru. And I spoke to students, researchers and academics in Chennai. Everywhere I spoke about Vimula Rohit. I spoke about his letter. That very unusual piece of historic document. I don't know how many of us could have written anything like this in the best of our state of mind. Everywhere I spoke and everywhere I saw tears in people's eyes. These were not Dalits, these were not Dalit activists. Probably they have not even heard of things like social justice and probably they don't understand that ideology. But something connects. How do we speak, which language do you use to connect to this large community? What do we do? How do we move forward? These are questions I think about. There is an easy, ready-made and perhaps natural language of grief. When you hear about something like this, when I heard about it, so many of us heard about it, and especially after you read that letter, you feel something inside you. There is an easy language of shame because to discover that our modern institutions have lodged inside their caste prejudices, which are quietly, almost invisibly inscribed in our modern institutions. This puts us to shame. So naturally, a language of grief, shame, anger comes to us. Especially when we see big games of political denials going on, followed immediately, of course, by games of political appropriation, our sense of anger goes up. So yes, we can speak in a language of grief, we can speak in a language of shame or a language of anger. But I don't want to use that language today. When I spoke to those students, I saw in their eyes an invitation to something else. Two weeks from then, I think this is the moment to introspect. This is a moment to reflect. And this is a moment to act. That is what I wish to share with you. As your friend said, I'm no newcomer to this university. In the last 20 years, I must have come here at least two dozen times. In my previous birth, I used to be an academic. And I used to come for seminars in this university for all kinds of technical things. And in my new birth, again, I come to this campus for various other things. 
first thought that came to me after that initial shock was over, and when the whole country was talking about University of Hyderabad, you know the thought came to me was this, here is one of the finest universities of this country. And is this the only thing it would be known for? I want to say to you, there are very few public institutions in this country that we can take pride in. And your University of Hyderabad happens to be one of those universities. I don't know how many students I've recommended, they come to me, where should we go, etc. The usual option, JNU, Delhi, and so on. And I always say, think of Pune, think of Hyderabad. Think of University of Hyderabad. These are some of the better options we have in the country. It is an outstanding place. We must recover, defend these institutions. Recovering public institutions is a duty. Complaining about privatization is easy. But complaining about privatization requires that we defend public institutions their integrity, their caliber, their excellence, which is what your university has done. This is one university which attracts people from all over the country. There are 40 central universities in the country, but not many of them are truly national. This happens to be one of those universities. And whatever we do must preserve the character of this university. I have also known this university for something else. As I said, I've been traveling to universities and at one point I was the member of the University Grants Commission. I traveled, looked around, must have seen some 50 to 100 universities of this country. I did not come across any university which was so sensitive to the question of social justice. And when I say university, I don't mean administration, please. A university is much more than its vice chancellor. A university is much more than its administrative block. By university, I mean students and the faculty. I've been to other places. I, was, I studied in JNU. I've looked at other universities. But in no other university of this country, I saw, I witnessed such animated and nuanced discussion on caste, caste discrimination, on Ambedkar, on Periyar, on legacies as I experienced here in University of Hyderabad. And then it struck me that you see, about Dalit atrocities, the reports about Dalit atrocities that you get are not necessarily from those areas where Dalit atrocity, atrocities against Dalit is at its worst. No. Because in those areas, no one dares report these things. Most of the reports about atrocities against Dalit come from those areas where a struggle and resistance has begun, where consciousness of dignity has arrived, where someone says, Hamara dula bhi ghodi pe baithega. That is where resistance, when resistance begins, that is where oppression comes out, that is when injustice is made public, that is when we begin to get reports about atrocities against the rights. I think something similar is happening here. Injustice, caste-based injustice is something which is happening across Indian campuses. This happens to be the one campus which was, which is more sensitive, where struggle for dignity has begun, where students, student community has learned a new language of future, the language of Ambedkar, the language of Peria. When student rebellion took place in Paris, it was not because Paris University was one of the most wretched universities in France, but precisely because it was one of the most advanced universities of France. This is how I see what's happening at the University of Hyderabad. Contrary to the image that has been created in the public domain, 
I do not see this place as one of the most backward places when it comes to caste injustice and discrimination. I see this as one of the most forward places. I see University of Hyderabad. I see the university students. I see the faculty. Because some of the finest literature on caste injustice has come from alumni or teachers or faculty of this university. So I see this as a university which could be a guidepost, a lamppost for the entire higher education sector in India. How do we do that? I know many of us don't feel like this today. When we hear something like this, it sounds strange. It doesn't have the right ring because this is not the mental frame in which we sit today. But please listen to what I'm saying. If we resolve, if all of us resolve it, I can tell you, 20 years from now, Bimula Rohit and the student community of Hyderabad University and the teaching community of University of Hyderabad would be remembered for having shown the path to the entire country when it comes to these questions. How do we do that? First, justice. There are many legal aspects of the justice. I would not go into that. But one thing is clear, that the vice chancellor of this university I do not mean the officiating vice chancellor, but the, the Dr. Apara. He has clearly lost moral authority to be a head of this institution. That should be said in plain words, straight words. No one should mince one's words in speaking the truth about this. He simply cannot continue as the head of this university family. something symbolic to mark what Rohit has meant not just to the university students but to students all over this country you have created this little stupa here and I said to your vice chancellor your officiating vice chancellor Professor Paraswami I said to him, why can't we have, why can't you invite some of the most creative teachers and faculty of your university and possibly outside to come up with a memorial for him right here, where his letter, it's an astonishing letter, I come back over and over again to that letter, it's an astonishing letter. He could have been bitter, he could have named 50 people, he would have said this person is responsible, that person is responsible. He didn't do that at all. He spoke to future. He spoke about stars. I thought that letter should be inscribed in stone and kept here for future generations of students and everyone in this university to remember. But we must go beyond symbols. And this is the moment to think hard about institutional measures so that something like this does not happen again, not on this campus, nowhere else. And as I kept thinking about it, I recall some of the things we were involved in when I was a member of the University Grants Commission for two years, and I came across two pieces. You know, the funny thing is that all that should have been done in this instance is already written about. It is available as written documents. And these are not just recommendatory documents. These are regulations which are mandatory for the university to follow. Three years ago, 
in 2012 and 13, three pieces of legislation came from the University Grants Commission. I had the good fortune to be associated with the formulation of these. One was UGC Promotion of Equity in Higher Education Institutions Regulation 2012. UGC regulations, and this is a gadget notification as you can see, these are binding on every single university and every college of this university, of this country. This particular regulation is only and only about caste-based discrimination in the university campuses and what to do about it. It lists various forms of caste-based discrimination and it says what is the responsibility of the university. It says within six months of the coming of this legislation, of this regulation, which is to say in the middle of 2013, every university would have an equal opportunity office and it will have an anti-discrimination officer of the rank of a professor and that all caste related discrimination cases will be referred to that office it prescribes the procedure and as Chayaji was reminding it clearly says withholding the fellowship of Dalit students comes under caste discrimination. It talks about various things and if you just look at this piece, you would see University of Hyderabad unfortunately has violated, clearly violated the letter of the law that they were meant to follow. Has the university established an anti-discrimination officer? No. Probably the university administration does not even know that they needed to do this. So here is one piece of legislation that simply needs to be enforced. All I'm saying is that we do not need to sit today and think about what new things should be done. These are old things, they are here, they just have to be implemented. And it is such a shame that these written instructions have not been implemented. The second is, Another piece of regulation called the UGC Grievance, Grievance Redressal Regulations 2013. They prescribe when there is any form of grievance, whether related to caste or related to anything else, how should that grievance be handled? It talks about grievance committees, but it says there shall be an ombudsperson over and above all that. And if you are unhappy with the grievance committee, a student can go to that ombudsperson who shall be a judge or an ex-judge. If we had these things available to us, if some of these institutions were working, we would not be where we are today. And the third piece of regulation is another set of instructions, guidelines from UGC on student entitlements. I wanted to read those out to you, but maybe I won't waste your time. Please read that stuff. Those guidelines on student entitlements clearly say forming political organizations, having political views, and expressing them is the right of the student community. <laughs> these are not my personal views. These are written guidelines which are mandatory on the university. That we have not been able to implement these three pieces. And in the case of Telangana and Andhra Pradesh, the specific instructions of the Andhra Pradesh High Court given in 2013, they have not been implemented. So the first thing we can do is to force, and when I met your officiating Vice Chancellor, I said, sir, he said that the AC meeting is coming up in the month of March and so on, and what can be done. I said, sir, the best way of redeeming the name of this university would be if University of Hyderabad becomes the first university in this country now to implement all these three pieces of legislation. <laughs> that, I think, would be 
a true tribute. Because it's easy to be carried away by the moment, easy to be angry, easy to give vent to our feelings, then get frustrated, annoyed, angry, and to hell with this and move away. No, that's not what Rohit wants. Rohit, who's looking over us, wants us to continue, wants us to sustain. And this is the way to sustain it. And I'm very happy that my colleague Chaya Ratanji has agreed that she will pursue not just your university, not just the 17 universities of Telangana, but all the 700 universities of this country. She will pursue them with RTIs. She will pursue them with cases in the court. I spoke to Prashant Bhushanji. He has agreed. If they, you know, we would pursue all the universities first with RTIs about why have they implemented these things? Have they even heard about this? Have they implemented these? If not, why? If when? If, if yes, when are they going to do it? So we will pursue these things and take them to court if necessary and get after it. And one thing I can tell you about Chayaji, once she doesn't normally agree to doing things, but once she agrees, she does it and pursues it diligently. I would request some of you, maybe three, four of you, five of you, can just become her assistants for 10 days. Give her the secretarial assistance that she would need to write those 700 PI, 700 RTIs, all kinds of preparations that have to be done. But let, uh, she said, you know, would that happen from Delhi? I said, no. Let us make Hyderabad into a national headquarter for opposing caste rape system. So please, after this speech, I would disappear, but she will not. Please make offer. Tell her you would spend a few hours. You don't need to come out of your university. Half of this stuff can be done on laptops. Give her time. Let us create this thing. Let us pursue this. Our, the depth of our feeling is not reflected in how, is how, in how loud is our voice today. The depth of our feeling is reflected in how long we persist in doing what we say we want. One last thing about Brahminism. We are here to oppose Brahminism. We have seen that, and yes, this campus too, I'm ashamed to say, has elements of that. But what is Brahminism? Why do we oppose it? Is Brahminism simply the attitude of those who happen to be in a caste called Brahmin? Or is Brahminism something deeper than that? Is it possible that all of us might carry elements of that Brahminism? To my mind, Brahminism is not, you know, you don't choose where you get born. As I keep saying in Hindi, koi application deke to paida huye nahi the. You know, you don't choose where you get born. Brahminism is the belief that accident of birth determines your virtues or absence of it. That accident of birth, being born on this side or that side, being born in this caste or that caste, makes you virtuous, makes you bereft of virtues. So yes, there is Brahminism in believing that those who are born in certain kinds of caste can pursue education and others can't. But remember, there is also reverse Brahminism, which is to believe that if someone is born in a caste called Brahmin, that person is bound to be anti this, anti that, is bound to be strange kind of person, bound to be a villain, bound to be this, that is also Brahminism. In our keenness to oppose Brahminism, let us not practice reverse Brahminism. It's important to say that. Because this university has produced some of the finest scholarship on caste-based discrimination. And some of that scholarship came from people who were born in Brahmin caste. If we really are deeply opposed to Brahminism, we should be able to detach our assessment of any human being 
from the accident of birth that the person has. I'm sure you should be able to do that. This is our challenge. If someone says, if someone is a Yadava, that doesn't make that person necessarily a friend of social justice. He could be a friend of social justice. He could be an enemy of social justice. So I would simply say to us, this moment, as I said, could be a moment of grief, could be a moment of anger, shame, everything put together. But when I look at this photograph, that is probably now not how this man wanted to be remembered. If he did, he would have written a very different kind of letter. Read his letter again. This man wanted to be remembered differently. He wanted to be remembered as someone who could take you to stars, as someone who could be an ambassador of hope. He may not have thought so, but he has become an ambassador of hope. And that is the feeling that we must keep in our heart as we carry it on with this struggle. It's a very important struggle. And as I was saying to your friends who I offered glasses of juice, I said to each of them, look, 20 years from now, when you sit on those chairs, remember this day when you sat here. This is what I would like all of you to do. I know of those who are listening to me today, many of them would become IAS, many of them would become, go to police, many of them would become professors, vice chancellors and so on. The test of our feeling and our love for Rohit will not be tested tonight when we sit to talk to each other. It will be tested 20 years from now when we sit on that chair. Please remember him on that day, as I would. Thank you very much. I want to tell us, uh, thanks a lot for that uh, reflective gesture and for all the very sharp suggestions that you've done, that you've given. A uh, lot of us have taken notes. Thanks for your time, for being with us and uh, for your genuine interest and for your genuine presence here. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Professor Yogendra Yadav uh, will be with us till 7 o'clock. He has a flight to catch and uh, friends who want to discuss can have some time. Uh, his time will come around 7. Uh, meanwhile, I would like to go on to the next speaker here, Sri Kadri. Sri Kadri. They have talk here. Major Kadri from the Health Hyderabad. Good evening, friends. Now, after Professor Yogen Yadav has already spoken, there is hardly anything for me to say except that I stand here in solidarity for whatever. Rohit Vemula stood for, and like he said, starting a movement is easy, but to con continue this thing, to sustain the movement is what we must aim for and we should do. The caste discrimination is a harsh, hard reality that not only you here today are facing, but across the country, so many universities, so many places of a higher learning etc. are suffering from this disease. God has created us free. It is Manuskriti that has stratified. I have no shame in saying so, though Professor Yadav said it is a it is an occasion, somber occasion, an occasion when we can be very sad, matter of grief, and also shame, and at the same time also angry. And all the three uh, <coughs> conditions that he described is how I, I have gone through. When I saw on Sunday in Delhi, girls who were being beaten by the police and also the hoodlums, then I thought it is a matter of shame, not only for us, for the politicians, for everyone. So I stand with you, with Vemula, 
<coughs> also, and I would request, like Professor Yadav has already suggested to your acting Vice Chancellor, that there should be something we should continue. Like he has, your acting Vice Chancellor has a proposal to start a memorial lecture in his name. And we had suggested to him to start also some kind of a foundation where not just this university, not just this one person, his name is uh, continued, but anywhere, wherever discrimination on the basis of caste happens, those students can be helped, those situations can be remedied and rectified. As I said to you, I thought, and I was taught also, that science has placed in the hands of man weapons of power and intelligence which if wielded intelligently we can banish human misery and inaugurate a reign of cultural, material and moral prosperity unprecedented in history but I don't see this coming as long as the people who are at the top who are ruling these educational institutions through politics are not removed. People who have no academic background have no business to be associated with academic institutions. I have been a student. I have been also the principal of, of management college and some engineering college, etc. I, I continue to be a student. I am with you. My heart goes for you. And like uh, like uh, uh, Professor Jaswin Jairat said that there should be no discrimination on the caste, but I also would like to add there is discrimination. On the basis of religion, you are seeing whatever happened in the North India and whatever is going on. And this has been on the rise. This is a very bad omen for the country, bad omen for institutions of higher learning, bad omen for the country. And I request through you all, and also like you have now, form some kind of a network. And this network would get you a lot of uh, potency to survive and to carry this forward. This movement should not die down. And now when you have established contacts with other universities in the country, so keep it up, contact them, and when, God forbid, if they need your assistance, go up to them, join them, and create again the same atmosphere of unity. There is absolutely nothing to say that a man who is born in a particular, by accident, like he said, Professor Yogen Yadav, it does not. In Islam, I am a Muslim, I, we do not practice this kind of discrimination. Anyone who is born anywhere, he can enter any mosque. <laughs> So we do not have anyone whose rich has a high, higher place to sit, another person is not allowed? No. We have uh, no such discrimination. But I, and, I, and no religion, as a matter of fact, if one is truly religious, no religion, really the true uh, uh, spirit of the religion does not permit this kind of discrimination. I am with you and I shall fight this risk, discrimination along with you and along with my friends and Professor Yogen Yadav and the others and uh, I congratulate you all for having established this thing and to, uh, I would like to see really this memorial become a symbol of justice, equity and peace. This symbol should become absolutely immortal. This will be the symbol of equality, fight for justice.